if you have been tuning into the new London CBC station, as many of us have very happily been doing over the last uh, few months, you will know the voice of our host for the first session of words, Rebecca Zanbergen. I hope I'm pronouncing that. Yes. Correct me. What it? It's, well, I would say Zanbergen. Zanbergen. Not Zanbergen. But what anyway. <laughs> the inflection matters. The inflection matters. And. Rebecca is our host on weekday mornings. Rebecca has worked for CBC for more than 15 years. She comes to us from CBC Kelowna, where she hosted the popular afternoon show, Radio West. Rebecca helped launch the program back in 2011. She grew up in rural Ontario and spent many years in Ottawa, graduating from Carleton's, Carleton University's journalism program. Rebecca has worked at CB station, CBC stations over the country, including a stop just down the highway from London in Windsor. She also spent time at CBC bureaus in Halifax and Whitehorse. Join me in welcoming Rebecca to host our first session of words. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming out, and thanks for the introduction, Josh. We might as well get right to it. Uh, we've got two great writers with us today who I believe are also pretty great friends, and I actually have it on good authority that they've partied in Washington together until 3 in the morning. Is that right? He's a monster. He, <laughs> he just drags me everywhere. It's crazy. <laughs> That's so, true. That, that was definitely true in Washington. It's not true at all. I, I, you were a willing draggy. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. So there's, no, there's no doubt about that. But They've all been swapping stories about their night out in London, too. So there you go. So th this should be a fun conversation. Ian Brown, of course, is a well-known name on the national newspaper scene. He's a feature writer for the Globe and Mail and is the recipient of numerous national magazine and national newspaper awards for his honest, smart, and witty writing. He's also an established author of several books, including The Boy in the Moon, which won the Charles Taylor Prize for Literary Nonfiction and the BC National Award for Canadian Nonfiction. His latest book, A Diary of My 61st Year, which asks if this milestone of 60 is the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning. Let's welcome Ian Brown. Okay, we also, of course, have Stephen Marsh, an accomplished author of six books and columnist for Esquire magazine, has written for many other esteemed publications as well. His latest book is called The Unmade Bed, The Messy Truth About Men and Women in the 21st Century. And although Stephen claims to live a quiet life in Toronto with his wife and two children, he says he's in the middle of a revolution, one feminism has produced. Here, here. Let's welcome Stephen Marsh. <laughs> So we've invited these two authors on stage together, you know, other than their being inspired writers whose works we can learn from, they're also both writing a lot about men, I would argue, and their place in the world. They also break down old cliches or notions about life, Stephen about the idea of a modern family, and Ian about what aging means for a man in his 61st year. So we'll start sort of from these points. Stephen, you start the book by wrestling with this decision to having to move for your wife's job, which I should say as a disclaimer, my husband has moved twice now for, for my work, so there you go. How does he feel about it? Uh, he's good, he's a good guy. So twice, so from where to where, and we, then from where to where? Uh, so he was based in actually Peru at the time, and he moved to Kelowna, and that was when we just met. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and then he moved to London for me. So, wow, yeah. love. He's a good guy. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. Why, why was this a defining moment for you? In your book. Well, I mean, it's one of those moments that journalists love because it's sort of, it was very personal and very intimate, but it was also kind of symbolic in this accidental way. Um, you know, I was a t you know, tenure track professor in New York, um, which is, and with, was writing novels there and was in the sort of novel scenes. So that's really all that I ever wanted from life was to be, I was teaching at City College in Harlem, unbelievable students, fascinating students, even in some small way making a difference, which is, you know, a very powerful feeling, although very rare in my life. So uh, there was, there was, there was, there was that. And then there was, you know, her, her job that she, she got offered that she runs Toronto Life in Toronto. And so I had to like basically break 
I, I, ha I was literally, in a sense, a patriarch. I was like a provider, I was a professor, people called me doctor, you know, and then I had to go back to being like a low-level freelance writer, which is how you find me today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and did that sort of provide you insight into the roles women in play, men now have in this world, at least in, in the Western world? I well, there guess. was, you know, I mean, it's Toronto, so it's like super liberal, and it's like downtown Toronto, so it's like... You know, I mean, literally draft dodgers or run the run the school system, right? Like, it's like, so, you know, it, it's not like it's... So I moved back there, and then there was this amazing response to it, I think, which was sort of the impetus for the book, which was older guys, like guys my father's age, um, they really saw it as shock. They saw it as shocking. They were, they, were, they were absolutely amazed. And men and women, too. They were both amazed that I would do such a thing. Um, whereas for people my own generation or younger, it was like, well, of course she's going to make more money, so you just you just need you just need to go where the most money is, and um, and that's where I had this kind of idea that what actually drives our gender politics is just money, and that everything else is a kind of reaction to to economic changes um, that are sort of very profound, but also kind of un, un, unarticulated. Ian, I'm not suggesting you're Stephen's father's age, but would your reaction be? I am actually <laughs> Stephen's father. You would be you're you're like ten years younger. You are you are the you are a love child. You're the result of a union I, I had many my years mother. ago. I was very young. She has a crush on you anyway, so. <laughs> Would your reaction be the one that Stephen described, shock? I mean, at some point in your life, would you have been shocked to, to move for a woman for a job? No, I would not have. I, my, my wife uh, is an American, and she was working in New York um, when I met her. And we commuted back and forth. Uh, we moved to... Um, uh, she moved up to Toronto, but then later she became the West Coast editor of GQ magazine. And I was working at the CBC, in fact. I had one of those jobs. I was on staff. If I'd stayed on deal. staff at the CBC, I would, I would now have the cash for life pension mm. that, that you have if you stay on at the CBC. I, I would consider myself a, a secure man if I'd stayed on. But I, I left and we went to LA and I wrote, you know, wandered around writing a book there. So no. But does I, that say more about you than what it says about life those years ago. Wouldn't you argue, Stephen? I mean, because you, you're suggesting that in the last 50 years we have seen big changes where your generation now says it's not a big deal to, to, to move for a woman. He's saying it never was a big deal. But I, I'm assuming that's kind of just you. I don't think so. I, oh. It's you, definitely just you, dude. <laughs> I, I, you know, there is this, this mythology uh, about, you know, the big strong guy who is the patriarch who stands up. And I, absolutely, th that patriarchy uh, and that uh, oppressive masculinity, aggressive masculinity that we've seen with Weinstein and, uh, uh, in this past week, th that the relationship between men and power is definitely there. Right? And that's because men at the moment have the power. But it's power that's the issue. If you haven't had an, any power or you don't have that relationship to power, as a man, you can be any age and, and not feel that you have to control the situation. I think it's a bit of an illusion, this, this mythology that... That guy, I mean, it's a brilliant book, and uh, you <laughs> must bullshit. read it. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but... but uh, Stephen this, looks skeptical, I have to say. Well, uh, here's it's what, a bit like Plato's cave. Here's, you know, like we're standing here, the, the, oh, look, you know, men look, have changed. Well, here, you know? here's, the, here's the point, is that it's, the idea, it's not the ideas or anything that's changed. When my wife took over Toronto Life 10 years ago, she was the first female editor of a mainstream magazine in Canada. Right. So, like, what actually happened is that she got... 30 years ago, she just simply would never have had that job, right. so the conversation about where we're going to move would never have come up. Right. But she gets the job, it does pay twice what my salary in New York Absolutely. is making. So, like, you but see, that's you not see a change in men, that's a change in the society it's and just in a our change relationship in the, to power. It's a, just Women a change in the whole economic basis. It's just, right. a, it's just a change in the whole economic basis. And I mean, that's the point of the book, is that if you look at... It's an excellent book. If you look at, you know women dr drive to take over the middle class, which, you know, 13 of the 15 growth industries in North America are totally dominated by women. women like, this was, this was a particularly bad year globally for the pay gap. It was the first year, but it was the first year since the 40s when the pay gap has actually increased, and it's a very slight increase. But, like, 
when you look at the trends generally, what you see is women getting more power and more money through more money. And then when you, the point here is like the choice that we faced was literally a new choice. Yeah. It was literally like no, no other woman had had that much power in the, in the media until that moment. And so that reframed, like, and then, and then our marriage picks up the pieces of, after, of that after the fact, right? Like then all the ideas about men, all the, like all your feelings, like ultimately, like it's like, well, she's gonna be making more money. Like you're gonna have to suck up your, any feelings you have, like don't count in comparison to that. I mean, and you, you said it's a change in society, not, not in men, but men is, society is made up of men and women, and it's a change in society because there's been a shift in values, I would think, no? Uh, look, I'm, I'm completely with you. <laughs> it, things have completely changed, uh, uh, and, and I'm thrilled that they, that they have. My own daughter is 25, was in love with a guy. They, he lives in Montreal, she lives in Toronto. They decide, as many of their friends do, cut and dried, it's no more, you know, there's no more commuting. It's, you know, we're too far away. We're going to end it. And they're like two bankers, you know, like there's a 7% return here and a 4% return here. And, that, and, I, and that's great. And, and, and it, maybe it is a change in the gender, maybe. But I, I think there were more, all I'm trying to say is, I think there are way more men hmm. who would be happy to cede power to women. Because as it turns out, power is not that great, you know. That's for it, sure true. And and if they want to have it, fantastic. And and they can take on the. Uh, seriously, I, I think this way there's this secret cult of guys out there going, go girls, you know, because. Join the military because I'm not joining the military. Yeah, no, exactly. You know. Like, <laughs> the Russians have to be walking down <laughs> Young Street before I join the military. <laughs> like, if you want to join, go right ahead. You know. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about your book. You begin with your 60th birthday. What perceptions did you have of what a 60-year-old is versus what, a, you know, what it what it actually was? Your perceptions versus what a 60-year-old actually is. I thought it, it was hideous. I, I could see 60 coming on, and I thought, I don't, I just don't want to go there. You know, I became. Um, I remember getting up one day and looking in the in the mirror, and noticing that um, it all started with losing my hearing. But I, 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 I looked, which is a whole other story, which I'm not going to tell again. But it, I, I looked in the mirror and I thought, who is that? And there was this guy standing there, and he had on his head, no hair. <laughs> and, and it was like Stonehenge all of a sudden, you know? There was like where they perform the human sacrifices in the middle of the circle. And so I went to my wife and I said, honey, what do I do about this? And she said, you need product. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, what, what is that? And she said, I, I'll go buy it. So we went to the store and we bought some product. And I learned to use that everywhere. And it was nice, you know, I liked the as it comes out of the plane, and you get the saran wrappy thing as you, as you rub it and you start at the back and you move forward, you know, and you get so it doesn't look greasy and you, you, you know, you've got your, and then one day, as I was approaching 60, um, I put it in my hands and I applied it to my face because <laughs> thinking that it was sunblock, because now, of course, you know, as I approach it, I have to wear 12,000 SPF, you know, sunblock because everything will, will kill me, you know, and, at that point, I, I remember going into the bathroom once at work uh, at the age of 59, I think it was, and uh, going into the stall and securing the door, as one does, and beginning to unbutton my shirt, which, which is not the garment you should remove, you know, to go to the toilet. And, and I still don't know what I intended to do in the bathroom that day. And so I... I I mean, I'm not too worried about physical decay. My, my parents lived into their 90s, and, and I'm pretty active. And, and God knows, illness, who, but that, you can't really worry about that. But mental decay terrifies me. And I saw it the way most people see it, as this hideous oncoming train that. And I began to do all the stupid things. You know, you know what you do. You you start to pack all the details in. You start to do everything way more. Like you start to do everything. This uh, that famous Woody Allen joke. You know that I mentioned. I think last night. Um, that you know he took a speed reading course because he was worried he wasn't reading enough. 
And so uh, they read War and Peace, and somebody said, oh, that's great, what's it about? He said, it's about Russia. <laughs> and, and you try and pack in so many details that you, you remember nothing, and details, of course, are the, they are the, the structure of episodic memory, so if you don't take in the details, if you don't write it, if you don't make it real to yourself, you won't remember anything. And uh, so I was, I was in deep panic, ponging between um, you know, the two traditional reactions to getting older. One is, woe is me, death is one day closer now, you know, waking up in the middle of the night as, you know, Larkin did in Obad, that terrible thing. And on the other hand, um, thinking, fuck this, I'm never going to die, you know? <laughs> like, I'm just right on top of things. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to control the whole... Is this being taped for on the air? I'm you certainly sorry. live that way. What? I mean, just from a guy who hangs around with you, I mean, like, you, you definitely... I mean, you literally dropped me off last night and then went out to a bar because, like, I needed to pass well, out I, from sleep. I just hadn't stopped thinking. I had to calm down a little bit then. Huh. I mean, I, like, it's... Uh, it, like, it, it, yeah. I find it, you know... Terrifying. But do you, do you think do about you not, Trump are, that are way? You af- are you afraid of it? Are you afraid of getting old? But how old? You're, not, you're nine or ten, aren't you? I'm 41, man. You're what? I'm 41. 41. I, well, I'm more worried about, like, will my children... Like, I'm in the, uh, will my children uh, end up, you know, destroyed kind of worries state. My own death seems actually like, I'll worry about that later. That's like, that's like problems to come. But, I mean, I wonder, do you, when you look at Trump, do you see, like... Like, he's obviously t- ha- aging and then reacted... Not fast enough for my taste. Yeah, but he, he's aging, and then he, like... So he does this absurd helmet. I mean, I've seen it in person, and when you see it in person, it is a feat of his engineering. Hair. His hair. His hair. I mean, it is, it's not just... It, like, it looks on TV one way, but when you see it in person, it's, like, actually got, like, four different tranches and stuff. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's absolutely crazy. And this kind of, like... Do you, when you look at him, do you see, like, a, a parody of your own kind of like aging masculinity? Like what could have, like what, how you could have responded in just the worst possible way? I, I certainly hope not. <laughs> well, obviously you're like the opposite. Like instead of like, I'm gonna get, uh, you know, a new sl- yeah. wife from Slovenia and I'm gonna do my hair like this and I'm gonna wear ties that go to here. Yeah. The way he can't dress is like so upsetting to me. Or walk. But, Pardon? Or walk. Or walk, or talk, yeah. But, the, um, but like, he, like, do you feel like there's some... Like, you're obviously rea- reacting to this event with self-consciousness and writing and, th- and thinking. Do you ever look at him and think, like, there's some part of me that just could have done that, that just could have gone the other way? I, I, th- I think he is an extreme example of, of uh, aggressive masculinity. He, he, what he represents to me is the worst part of masculinity, yeah, me too. which is the notion that you can control everything and that you are right all the time. That, that A, you have to be right, B, that you can be right, that there is nothing in the world except intellectual certainty and, and the exercise of power. It just strikes, the whole thing strikes me yeah, as, I mean, as ridiculous. I can't believe I wrote a book about gender like just before the 2016 election. <laughs> like it's just brutal, right? I mean, like it's like, like you know, he represents to me like so much that is. I mean, I have a phrase in there called the hollow patriarchy, which to me describes like. Have it written down here? Oh, you do. So it's like it's how you know m- there are these icons of power, but then the actual sub like partly, but then the substance is. F- crumbling away, but also it's like women are taking over the middle class, which they really are by a lot of metrics, whereas men remain, you know, controlling, like they're only 16% of equity partners in law firms are women, for instance, only like 23% of surgeons are women, like the top things and ownership of things really remains pretty traditionally masculine. So this is, creates this turbulence, but he's like the ultimate icon of it, Trump. I mean, he just is the ultimate, like he's he has everything bad about masculinity, but then not only that, the thing that I find interesting about him is that everything that I regarded as traditionally good about good about traditional masculinity, loyalty, uh, paying people for their work, honoring, co- honor, honor, in a word, honor. Civility. Civ- honor and civility, and like a sen- he is the absolute inversion of it all. It's, like, it's, like, it's not just that he's like, a, it's not just that he's like the worst man in the world. It's also that he takes masculinity, what was good about it. And perverts it. And perverts it, yeah. 
I want to talk, actually, I just want to go back to vanity a little bit, if we could, because I feel as though you talk a fair bit about your hair, and you talk about whether women find you attractive anymore, and losing weight, and no, all of these sorts of things. And yeah. I'm sort of sit, sitting here thinking, well, you kind of are off the hook because you are a man. I mean, by default, people assume as you get older, you get more distinguished, whereas women just get old. So I feel like <laughs> that's the perception often, right? So I feel like you are free to be distinguished just the way you are, and you have all these worries, but they're not really justified. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that may be true. Um, I certainly don't feel that way, and I would bet I could find men in this audience who don't, who don't feel that way. You know, the, the, one of the difficulties of living in a highly, in a society where he increasingly, and because of Mr. Trump partly, everything is for sale. And everything is on the market now. Um, we view getting older as a kind of failure. And, and, and it's projected that way because the commercial world doesn't really have much use for older people. They have a lot of money. But, you know, they're not buying another Le Creuset you know, fry pan, because they've got the one that they bought 40 years ago, you know, and they're not buying another car because they prefer to go and learn to speak Italian, in, you know, living in some tiny little place in Umbria or something, if they can afford that. Um, they want to get in their RV, you know, or, they're, or go camping around North America. Um, so that because we don't buy things, we're seen as, as failures. But there is this larger notion that, that age and dying are not stages in life, but stages of failure. And you know, you, I look at what was I reading yesterday in the Globe and Mail, some some newspaper, uh, <laughs> it, where, where young people were just saying, you know, they're, those people are old. And you, I mean, you, once you start looking for it, you see it everywhere. This, I think, age is. Uh, does not ch choose a gender. It, uh, it afflicts all of us. I'm not, that's not to say that men don't have an easier time of it. But once you hit a certain age, uh, those things kind of disappear. My wife always says, even, even physically, I, my wife always says that as people get older, men start to look like women and women start to look like men. <laughs> and, you know, there are days when I, I agree with her. <laughs> Later on, that's coming. I'm really trying to figure out what does that mean. I don't know what it means, so I'm afraid to ask. Yeah. And but I mean, I think that is unique. Not maybe not unique, but certainly in in the Western world, we care less about old people than in other parts of the world, right? Where they sort of they they held he. he hold them in such high regard as, as sort of people who are very wise, even in our you know, uh, indigenous communities, there's more of that, our elders. Why, is, why hasn't that resonated here in North America in the same Be way? Because this is the center of Western capitalism. Because you know, it's hard to maintain a house and a community and a family. And community is what we're, that's what those in Italy where you have grandmothers walking around and living at home, that, that's a different conception of a, com of a community. And I don't think we, I don't think, you know, that's a more, um, a less, quote, masculine, more matriarchal culture maybe. Can I just bring something up here? Like, you guys have all the money. Who's, like, who's you guys? Over 60. Yeah, like, that's true. So, like, the idea that you're sitting there, like, undervalued by the marketplace, like, you are the marketplace. But we don't spend The millennials that. can barely afford avocado on their toast. I, I'm, not, know? I'm not saying, that, you know, we deserve it. I'm just saying we, there's more of us. We have more of the money. In, in the States, three, dollar, three tax dollars goes to people over 65 for every one dollar that goes to people under 18. And, and, and that's two of because those tax dollars are medical tax dollars. Yes, that's true. But, like, it, it's, there is a... There is a Certainly, a, well, I mean, look at Toronto, right? Like, only older people can own a house, for instance, right? Like, now I'm just on that line, <laughs> like, but you, you, don't you feel like at the same time as there's these invisibility issues, these that there is this kind of like, at the other hand, your daughter might be living in your house for the rest of her life because she's never going to be able to afford an apartment, whereas you could. Uh, this is more complicated. Okay. You know, uh, as is often the case with your opinions. 
as, no, I, you know, I mean that lovingly. Uh, I took it that way. Yeah. Uh, my, my daughter and your children will own houses. Uh, they will own houses. I, I have no doubt of that. They, it may not be the house that you were lucky enough to buy because you bought early enough in the life cycle of the city that you were closer to the center of town. They may be, you know, 20 minutes farther out or right. an hour farther out. But they will, they too will will own uh, houses. So I think the they'll have nothing for the rest of their lives. Despair is a little over. Overbought. All I'm saying is genuinely, if you're gonna if you're gonna go talk, especially in our industry, if you go and talk to people my age or younger, they envy the older generation, because things things are getting worse, and they're just going to get keep getting worse until we're all dead. Really? Well, yeah. I met a 35 year 30 year old the other day who said to me, uh, "What is this obsession you, your generation has with dying?" I said, "We're not <laughs> obsessed with dying." He said, "Well, you, you you spend all your money on medicine just to, to stay alive." <laughs> And I said, well, what, what am I supposed to do if I contract cancer? You want me to just say, hey, I'll sit out the treatment because I want you to have my spot. Well, look, I mean, idiots come on. aside, idiots aside, like, do we, I mean, let's just, you know, put the idiots He was aside. a lawyer. <laughs> so what? What does that mean? You repeat, you, you idiots aside. You a stupid aside. lawyer? I mean, my God. There's, they're pretty thick on the ground. Yeah. Stupid 30-year-old lawyers. I mean, there's uh, no problem finding that. So, yeah, That's that, hardly, like, what a rarity, yeah, you know? Yeah. I, look, I don't want to have all the money. What I want to have is... is Fantastic. A, no, really. I've got an arrangement for you. But, but I would like us to spend it on something... Intelligent. For instance, um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was out in Banff, and I went to something called the Banff International String Quartet Competition. Have you ever been to that? So it's this string quartet competition. There's 40 string quartets. They go to Banff, and a and 1,000 people come for the week, and they listen to them. They keep scorecards, you know. And the average age of the Banff International String Quartet audience is something like 79. <laughs> Banff is built on a hill. So <laughs> to get to the 10 o'clock concert, they're going to breakfast at 6.30, you know, because then you get home, you do the toilet, they do the teeth, blah, 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 and then you start the long trudge towards the main hall. And they move around, and it's unbelievable to see 80-year-old people engaging with culture. And I, as I watched them, I thought, this is what a university campus should be. This is where uh, retirement homes should be. They should be buildings on university campuses so that people who are getting older and dying can learn as they go. And the people, who, the young, callow shitheads who are, you know, coming into the system, they can see people dying. And they will think to themselves, oh, that happens to people. Maybe I'll prepare for that. You know, there a is a program bit. here at Western where I think three or four music students are living in a facility, a home, mm -hmm. and uh, performing for them. That's mm -hmm. sort of, and then they have free rent. So it's kind right. of a they, done, they do that at home. It's becoming exactly, incredibly common. Yeah. They give the students free room and board if they do 20 hours a month or something. It's not a very big ask to uh, at, at, at in the place where they're living with these. Yeah. The University of Calgary is doing it as well. I so think that's great. I, so I'm happy to give my money towards an intentional community of you know multiple ages. That that would be. Then you can have some of my money. And how, how, did your, <laughs> how did your relationship with your father in his, his later years inform some of these opinions that you have now about all of this? Well, I had a good relationship with my father, so, uh, which is pretty rare well, amongst guys, I think. Um, and he was a very graceful man. Uh, he was 98 when he died, um, and we were pals. You know, and he was 40 when I was born. So he, uh, but he was very physically capable. Um, but he hated not being useful. He, he, you know, he was one of these English guys, right? Four years old, he goes to boarding school. He goes into the navy. He becomes a commando. You know, he, and like he, and never talked about it. My mother pushed him around all, all his life. It was a shit to him. You know, I mean, just. But he was a great, great, graceful guy. And I saw his decline. His de he had one of those lucky lives, you know, what they call the rectangularized life. N normally, you, the graph from your point of view is 
You know, you get up here, and then it, there's this long, slow decline. He did not do that. He was up, he went to the end, and he fell off the cliff, right? The last six months of his life were... Uh, and he hated being dependent on people. He wasn't angry about it. He was sad about it. He used to cry at the table. And, uh, and he hated not being useful. If, and he was in this an, a standard older person's home, retirement home, after my mother died. And he was surrounded by women of his age who gossiped and wanted him to sit at their table. And he wanted to sit at his own table. <laughs> you know, he didn't want to be engulfed by that maw of North Toronto, you know, bullshit. So, I, so I, if he could have lived, and I have a tiny little house in Toronto, you know, it was impossible. But if we'd planned it, I don't know, if there, were, if there were ways that he could have lived down the street in a place where he was, could have joined my life and I could have joined his more easily, I would have, I would have loved that. I really would have loved it. The weird thing is he got, you know, I have a disabled son and he, my, he doesn't speak and he'll some, some sit next to you. My dad, when he began to get old, he would see my son and he would say, Walkie, come over here. And they would sit next to each other. My father couldn't get up. Walker can't speak. They can't talk to one another. And they would sit next to one another for an hour, thoroughly content. I've never seen Walker sit still for longer than a minute, you know. Uh, if to me, this is emotional and not logical, but to me, that is the model of a community I would like to see, and a, and, and, a, and a vision of aging that I would like to see. You know, where we're, where there's no success and failure, where there's doing things together, and we don't worry about the outcome as much. That's what offends me about Trump, and that's what offends me about these stupid notions of, of aging, as opposed to telling it as it actually is and not judging it, you know? If, I'm sorry to ramble on like that, but... Oh, I, that I, was a very enlightening, thank you. Thank you. And how in... in My problems are gonna seem very small <laughs> in comparison. <laughs> from, from your point of view, when we look at what, what was the modern family, how does... How does the, I mean, have you considered how aging fits into all of that and how, and how the world has changed and how we consider people who are older now? I mean. You know, it's funny, I, I haven't really, I didn't put it in the book. Um, I, you know, I probably should have because I think one of the things that's, that's interesting is that we think of the traditional family as eroding, but then when you look at the actual inf the, uh, the actual statistics and you look at the economic data, like what's what's really happening is the family matters more than ever. It's just being redefined in along different ways. And you know, it's funny because like you're saying, I, if I'd planned that, well, I just did that. My mother moved into an apartment who's 70. You know, we decided she moved from she was in Halifax on her own. She decided to move down the street from us exactly for this reason because and you know like the the economics benefits of a grandmother this is actually something that's not talked about a lot but they're really huge i mean it's you're monetizing your grandmother <laughs> not my grandmother my mother your mother uh, yeah, oh, yeah. even better <laughs> my grandmother was useless but uh like, but the uh um both of them were but the uh but the um yeah, but when you, like, it is, these kinds of, I think these kinds of, th these reevaluations of the family that we're seeing across the spectrum are also questioning us to be like, well, the, the atomic model of the family that we followed for so long, mom, dad, two kids, alone in some suburban house, um, that's actually not really a healthy way to live. Like, you want to be surrounded by a tribe, really. And, um, and in, you know, like, I didn't, I didn't put that in the book, but, um, I mean, I, I think these other arrangements are really healthy. And I think, I mean, that part I do have, and, like, one of my son's closest friends um, is the fifth child of a gay couple. So they live in a massive house in, on Palmerston Avenue. They had two kids by, they had two, two kids then one kid, then two kids. I'd, one was adopted and then the others were surrogates. And they live, they, so they live in this, and then what they did is they brought over a 
Filipino nanny for each kid and then let the person stay in the house afterwards free of charge just so that there was this in, I mean, it's, it's an incredible scene when you go over there. It's like there are like 30 people in the house at any time. And it couldn't be more loving and it couldn't be more a, a better way to raise a child, right? And so, and it's just because like, I think we have this unconscious, unthinking, market-driven mode. It's kind of advertising, like this is what your family should be like. Actually, there's a lot of ways to have a family. but. And I think that is becoming clearer. It's just that the family, the idea that the family is, is not true. The family matters just as much as it did 100 years ago, and it will matter just as much 100, 100 years from now. I, I wonder why I didn't talk about aging. It's interesting, because I, I didn't, it never even occurred to me because to Because you're 11 it. years old. I mean, yeah. yeah. No, well, I do you're have not kids, old enough so. to worry about it yet. I guess I was, had babies, so like having babies, everything it just gets eradicated from your life when you've mm. got like an under, like a one-year-old, two-year-old. But it is an interesting part of how this, of, of, how, of how gender is being rethought, really. And you know, the, like the other thing is like this, when you get up to the 80 range, like the g gender discrepancies start to appear really starkly. Like the suicide rate is 20 to one for men and women mm -hmm. over 80. And all, like all sorts of things get really, really exacerbated mm -hmm. as, people, as people age. I really should have, actually. It's okay. Dang. <laughs> You're well. Do, do you think that um, the, the breakdown in gender politics and the changes that we've seen have sort of led to that change in the family as well? I mean, has, has women become, woman becoming more powerful? Has that changed the dynamics of the family in other ways too? Not just that the woman might be the sort of the lead, but that you know, we now see many different structures in family? Well, see, the basic argument of my book, I mean, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief so it's not too boring, but is that <laughs> ideas don't really, I, the, you know, we read it a lot about like ideas of masculinity or shifting and stuff like that. What actually happened is a very strong economic, uh, economic trend where people, countries that have more female participation in the workplace are infinitely stronger than countries that don't. So. The reason that Japan is now like desperately trying to teach men how to raise kids, and like I'm going there in two weeks to look at these, they have these elaborate series of classes because they have no tradition of child rearing for men really almost at all. And so the reason they're putting such an effort into that is because it's a huge barrier to economic growth. So the ec like to me, what's happened over the 20th century is that capitalism has won, and part of capitalism is that you need women in the workforce. And then from that, we imagine that we have these new grand ideas, but in fact, we're just playing catch up with this very basic trend that underlies, you know, has, like for, and you know, like just to take an example, like the Reagan-Bush years, the, the, those 12 years, which were the backlash against feminism, the pay gap closed by 13 cents in those years. So those were, in fact, that, that was the, those were the years where women entered the professional forces in ways that they just never, professional lives in a way they never had before. So you could take those years as an intellectual defeat for feminism, like they got crushed at, in, in Congress, like they had no say, but at this, it, didn't, it didn't make any difference. Because the, the underlying economic trend is like, you're gonna have a, a, a woman doctor, like period. You're not, like it's not, there's no way for you not to. Right. Don't, don't you think you could see, I'm sorry to interrupt, or did you have a, um, don't you think you could see Harvey Weinstein in that, it, it, through that same oh. lens, that, that what you're, what's so astonishing about it is that the whisper, what's the thing I'm talking whisper about? Whisper network. The whisper net where women talk about bad guys, um, that the whisper net, that women are actually being believed when they say, this jackass, you know, did this, and, and they're being believed. Uh, when... Gomeshi uh, happened, women were not being believed. And I'm not saying that everything's changed, but that, that too is evidence of this. I talked to my wife about it and she said, it's just, it's just, evidence it's just women things. having power. She said, it's just that brute reality. Like yeah. that's why they're being believed. I hope women don't abuse it. I mean, I hope I hope that you don't do what guys did. Which this is the great debate, of course. You know, amongst feminists. I mean, Jermaine Greer. You know, mm -hmm. should we should we change the way power is used, or do we just want power? And if you just want power, you know, power it has that corrupting influence. So it'll be interesting to see what Pleasantville looks like. You know, when women. Can, you know, it'll. I mean, I hope it. 
I, I hope you, it gets better. It has to. I think there get, really is a sea to. change happening right now. Like you think this is something that's going to stick? This this Me Too. Don't you? I I don't know. I don't. I feel as though. Who's we're got the head microphone here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I am a woman. Maybe I'm looking at it a bit differently, but I, I feel as though like the floodgates have opened. But I'm not convinced that it's the change that that's going to lead to like the big change. I don't know. What you is know, the big change, though? You know what they say about revolution? It never really solves the problem. It just shifts the burden of right. of you know pain to from one shoulder to another. So. That's cheerful. Jeez. Well, <laughs> oh my God. I'm old. Well, you know, I'm a cranky old way? guy. You know? I, no, I think we should. Let's let's talk about something more fun, shall we? Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> there, that's literally everything else in the world. So. <laughs> I well, I was telling you earlier that I listened to a couple of Sheila Rogers interviews to sort of gear up for this, and I listened to one that was an hour long with you, and you literally only talked about sex. So I thought, is that I did, or, or we did. The the two of you. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, is, am I, is that what we're supposed to talk about? But it does raise questions for both of your books about sort of the power of sex and the of sex as you age. And I wondered what your thoughts are on in both of those scenarios are, since I hear you also talked about it last night. So Are we talking about se sex while you're aging, or are we talking about sex changing over time sex while you're aging but can you actually you're do it that about long sex. that you're actually aging while you're I'm, I'm getting older so am I honey. was that <laughs> so am I <laughs> what is that, what that like said? Balzac said that there goes another novel right yeah sex <laughs> while aging sex so sex good I aged a year I mean my god <laughs> you've heard of tantric sex it took a well year now. off we're, my we're, life we're, oh my god <laughs> worth it completely worth it <laughs> Sir, what were we talking about? Something serious. I important. think your book is about the, 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 the power dynamics of sex over time, and yours is about how sex changes as sex. you age. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, great. Yeah, nice. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I do think we're in, we're in, we're in a sea change for sure. Um, you know, new, new ways of, of, negotiating sex or coming up but I think you know to me like the several things are happening at once that like for one of the things that's interesting that that I noticed in the book is that sex is in a massive decline right like the quantity of sex that people are having no I'm serious like in in it is dropped by about 20 percent according to censuses right like it's it's a like if you go to the <laughs> my life backs up those numbers I'm just saying <laughs> look you can believe me or, like in Japan Japan's see, already seen this it's called the herbivore men and it's about 33 percent of men in Japan who basically don't leave their houses and are totally uninterested in any aspect of traditional masculinity, including sleeping with people, right? So they, and this is, this is part of the reality that's changing too, but um, like to me it is economic. Like the thing about the Harvey Weinstein story that is that the reason, you know, you could say it was a sea change that caused it, but what actually happened is like he, he lost his purchase over the media. Like he just, like he, he was no longer, like they knew this, the New York Times had this stuff 10 years ago, but Harvey Weinstein was paying for their arts pages. And it was when, he, when, when the media declined to the point where they didn't need that money, and he didn't, and he kind of lost a little bit of power himself, that's when it all came out. So to me, when you look at these, even things that are as gross and monstrous as Weinstein, there is ultimately an economic answer at the back of it. Right. And, um, and, you know, I think, yeah, like I, I think like money is actually more important than sex is what I would say. When you, when you look at the, when you look at why things change and why the norms are changing, it, the, the motive is almost always economic. But I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but when you say ch sex is changing, the actual, the way people are having Well, that's it, for I mean, sure it is. It is? Oh, yeah. What, what it, I, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, so what's what's the new thing now? Like, I, I'm obviously well, I'm you, out of the picture. Do you really want me to talk about this? I I'm all ears. Well, so. we could start with we could start with like uh, anal sex, right? So anal sex is now a completely normal sexual act. You know, like when when I was a kid, it was like you've got to be kidding me, right? I have yet to meet. I, I I've asked many women this question, not in flagrante delicto, but. 
We are being I asked have yet these to meet a right? woman who has said that that it's it's uh, casual fare. I, I well, I mean, you can look. I'm just operating from actual statistics here. It's actual statistics, yes. or are you operating from uh, the uh, sexual porn, survey from the Kinsey, the Kinsey, the Kinsey site from uh, 2012? Really? So more yeah. of it? Okay. Way more. All right. And and like. A, it's like an, it's become normalized, just okay. as fellatio was normalized a generation before. W so which kind fellatio. of fellatio? Oh, okay. <laughs> don't make me is. say these words. I know you like to hear me say them because it makes me squirm. <laughs> but like, don't make me don't make me say it again. I'm, I thought I. Th How I, do you I think understand. sex is changing? In How, what, what's your, what's your aging sex life like? Still, still not having anal. <laughs> um, I think I can. I think I can say that publicly, actually. Okay. And I think my wife would be happy that I did say it. Very old-fashioned. Yeah, oh. I mean... Look, I love the old-fashioned things, you know. Uh, uh, do you hold hands and walk <laughs> oh, through yeah, the park? Is that mainly what it is? Hands, yeah. Yeah. We hold hands and, you know, neck and stuff like that. <laughs> and, and, you know, we think of ourselves as like an old dodge or How something. How did we know? get to this point in this conversation? <laughs> uh, I, I wasn't expecting to go here, but... Right. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> I don't, you know, this is the other interesting thing about, about getting older, I think, is that I expected at 60 or sometime around then, to my horror, that my desire would drop away and that I would, you know, just not be interested anymore. Whereas what in fact has happened, and I, a, a lot of people report this, not in the Kinsey report, but in my own personal researches for the book, um, uh, is that one's desire actually becomes more Catholic. A small c, right? Not you have mass. You have you, you have mass before you have anal. You know, this is the blood of Christ. No, not. What is a capital C Catholic? Small c Let's talk Catholic. About that. So your your desire becomes uh, more all encompassing. So you know, before my quote sexual desire might have related to you know women like my wife, you know tall, slim brunettes kind of thing, intelligent brunettes. Um, uh, whereas now, you know, somebody could appear wearing a, you know, propeller beanie on a skateboard, you know, and, 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 and I'd be not sexually interested, but interested. My, my desire is, is more kind of panoptic. I'm, I really am more passionate about just about everything. And I never expected that to happen. I thought I was going to go out in a, you know, little hard nut of crankiness. But, but Definitely not going to that. Maybe that'll happen soon, but... Well, who knows? Yeah. Apparently my sex life could use some broadening. So, you know, the, the, maybe the best is still ahead of me. I don't know. Look in the research. See what's, see what's considered normal. I, well, anyway, what was your question? <laughs> My question was about how sex has changed over time for as a person who's aging, not over time, the decades, but oh, you in mean, your own life. Oh, I see. You mean frequency or something like that? Desire was a good point to make. I think that was something that we talked about I, now, which was good. I think uh, that to, 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 the thrilling part is that tenderness actually uh, becomes, uh, I think, really important because you realize how, how important. It is not just tenderness in your sex life, but tenderness in your friendships and tenderness. In, it is easier for me to say, you know, I really like <laughs> honey. I've been meaning to ask you, could we try? Uh, is it? I don't want your. How Catholic has your no, desire become? No, it's easier. It's easier for me to say that I. I really like. You know, hanging around, Steve. I really, it's, we, we always have fun. We don't see each other that often, but we always have fun wherever we go. It would have been harder for me to say that 20 years ago because I was a man who was going, who had to keep defending, controlling, being right. Are you, because I've seen this in my own dad. My dad is suddenly a blubbering mess all the time. Like he's super emotional where he never used to be. And all of a sudden I'm always worried he's going to start crying. Is that, is, I mean, are you more emotional as, if, as you've been aging? I've always been a bit of a sap. So I, you know, I, yeah, but yeah, I think what happens is as you get older, you realize that our time on earth is limited and and it is that uh, the fact that it is finite that makes it so exalted if it went on forever we wouldn't f feel its importance so deeply but as you get older you realize that it is finite and so you find you know beauty in and 
I think what makes you cry is hope. I've had this debate with many people. Uh, it's always actually some sense, maybe unconscious in you, that, that the, the, there's an example of somebody who believes things could be better, more loving, deeper, you know, better. I see it even in my son Walker. You know, when I see he's hitting himself and he hurts and, and he really, and, and then he can't make the hurting go away by hitting himself and so he hits himself harder. This makes me cry, but what makes me cry is not his pain. That makes me angry and, and, and makes me want to protect him. What, what makes me cry is his hope that he could actually have, have beaten it and he didn't, you know? And I think you become more, I don't know, I, more alert to that. It's one of the great payoffs. It's one of the only payoffs. <laughs> <laughs> we, ha we have about four minutes left to wrap here, but Stephen, I'm wondering if you, do you look to Ian for any advice on, on, on life because he's an older dude? He's aging gracefully. <laughs> well, well, no, like, um, no, 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 Qu quite seriously. No, 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 I, I, that, was, that was a no yes kind of thing. I mean, I, I don't think Ian is the kind of guy you would go to for wisdom, but he's, he, he's, the, he's definitely, I mean, he's a model for me. I mean, I love the way he writes. I love the way he approaches questions and I mean like the stuff that I'm trying to write is where you go and look at things frankly and without um, prejudice and where you try you and you like the writing that I the writing that I admire ultimately is when people go into a story with an idea and then allow that idea to be destroyed by the facts and Ian is one of the best people who, that, his best pieces. And so is he, uh, he and the admiration is mutual. Yeah, so. I mean, like, he is one of the, when, when he, especially with his bigger pieces, um, I think, they're, they're, when you get to that kind of, like, erasure of, your, of prejudice, that's, that's insight. And, you know, that's actually very rare. There's not, it's not like you can go and just hire a kid to do that or you can just, or people automatically do it. It's actually having the temperament to be able to approach these questions with hum enough humility um, is very rare. And de I, I would just say, like, it's, it, yeah, Ian's definitely a model for that. I mean, you know, I do feel a bit like he's like, oh, I'm fading into invisibility. And I'm like, uh, I've been around with you for the, the few times that we have been out, like, you're you're not fading into invisibility, like you're quite the other thing. <laughs> um, so, it, um, and you know, also Ian has an adventurous spirit, which is also rare, you know. And I think that, and uh, it's, and you know, frankly, it's especially rare. It's like a funeral before I die. <laughs> yeah, but you know, like well, the, no, I mean, the, all the orations are taking. It's really quite pleasant, though. Right? But what, like what the the the, the, advent, the this is an older like that the insight thing you had that when you were thirty that's nothing that's nothing really surprising although I do think a lot of people l lose that um, but I do think the fact that you're aging but you're just like what's happening in the world I got to go see it and report on it like a lot of people lose that really when they're my age. Like, because when, when you're, even when you're my age, it starts to become like, it's not fun to be sitting in the cold for 12 hours watching people be tear gassed. Like, you, it's, it, you, you, the thrill of it is, gets pretty muted. So you, you, you re it requires a kind of discipline to go out and see those things. And, you know, Ian, Ian's definitely kept that. And I admire that, and, you know, with that end. Well, right. thank, thank you, Ray. That's... <laughs> But you know, a week. I, I, I feel like I'm at your wake or something. But. No, yeah, no, I know. And uh, you have a, a minute to wrap. I'm sorry. <laughs> a minute to wrap. Well, I, I do think that what, what Stephen's t talking about, not about me, but about w w that kind of work, th that's one of the great dangers actually now, is that uh, that kind of writing, what it's called journalism, it's, or writing a novel, or it, it, that observational, this is what I saw, this is what was actually true, as opposed to what was supposed to be true, or what other people told me should be true, or what I, some darker part of myself wants to believe is true, Th that talent that he has to go and see something and describe it, I think is being confused with advocacy. And I would say, you know, 90% of what you read 
you might think you're reading journalism, but you are reading some kind of advocacy. And it's, and it's made so easy by the two-way phone. Uh, you know, George Orwell says, as soon as they create a television camera that works both ways, then everybody will think alike. The, you know, the, the mind, uh, the big brother will have won because we will all have the same opinion all the time. And that, that's why, you know, this kind of book, um, that kind of writing is important because I think we're losing our, 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 yeah. our faith in it. And the thing is that the kind of writing that I admire is the opposite of advocacy. It's the when you go in thinking you're supposed to make an argument and then you find out that the truth is so much more complex and nuanced, which it always is. Without exception, the reality on the ground is infinitely more nuanced than you think. So, you know, that, and that, there's nothing more important than that to me. That's the whole point of writing, mm -hmm. to get to that. Yeah, but this is why Trump is such a, you know, uh, this is why he's such a danger. I mean, the guy is incapable of nuance. taking in an idea of nuance, yeah. And he seems to be winning with that yeah. point of view. It's Well, that's a sad note to end on, but he's not winning. And I want to thank you both, Stephen Marsh and Ian Brown. Let's give it up for the two well, of them. Thank you.